I'd like to welcome all of you to today's uh, Telco Project Lecture. Uh, joining us today is uh, Steve Horowitz. Uh, professor Horowitz is the Charles A. Dana Professor of Economics and Department Chair at St. Lawrence University. Uh, he's the author of three books, uh, Hayek's Modern Family, Classical Liberalism and the Evolution of Social Institutions, um, ma Macroeconomics and Austrian Perspective, and Monetary Evolution, Free Banking and Economic Order. Uh, today, Professor Horowitz is here. Uh, Horowitz, I'm adding an extra syllable. Professor. <laughs> like, like no one's ever done that to you in your name. <laughs> ah, they, uh, we respond to everything at this point, right? Professor uh, Horowitz will discuss the relationship between capitalism and the family. He'll argue that prior to capitalism, the primary purpose of the families was production. Um, I don't know why I'm reading this. He's here. He's going to tell you. So please join me in welcoming uh, Steve Horowitz. Thank you, Chris, and thank you all for coming, and thank you for your patience as I unwound that problem. I, I was thinking to myself, I'm very happy that this is a talk that I've done a number of times. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be like completely frazzled uh, and, and not happy about doing this. But I am happy to be here. Um, and my title, I have a subtitle, right, How Capitalism Created More Loving Families and Liberated Women. Um, that's a provocative subtitle because... It's actually part of it is part of what I want to argue, but it also is a suggestion there that uh, sometimes we don't we don't hear very often. So let me start with a kind of overview of the argument. If I can. Oh come on. Oh well, now we're working. That's nice and slow. Um, first thing I want to say is prior to the emergence of capitalism, the family in many ways was not an especially nice place. I'm going to talk about what exactly I mean by that, what it means to say it was not an especially nice, nice place. And the related argument is that what we know and love is the modern family, and I'll just say what I mean by, by modern family as we go along as well, is I would put the word largely a product of capitalism. And there, there were other forces at work, of course. But we might say more generally it's a product of classical liberalism. It's a product of the revolutions of the late 18th century, uh, the capitalism, democracy, and to some degree, the, the declining power uh, of the church and, and the separation of church and state. This claim, though, that the modern family, and by the modern family in particular, if we think about the idea of marriage for choice and for love, if we think about the ways in which, particularly in the 20th century, a variety of different forms of the family have opened up for people. People have more choice about issues surrounding who they love, how they love, what constitutes a family. That arguing that those are a product of capitalism has an, in has an interesting uh, consequence. And that is, it makes both progressives and conservatives uncomfortable. It makes conservatives uncomfortable often because they often believe, that some, with varying amounts of sincerity, that capitalism is great. Okay? But to argue that capitalism produced this range of family forms and this sort of modern uh, sort of uh, 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 dis dispersion of different family forms is something they may not be comfortable with. Oftentimes, conservatives want to argue that we need to hold on to a particular view of family and that the sort of freedoms that we've had with respect to the family and family issues have been problematic. So to argue that something conservatives at least claim they like has caused something they don't like is, is interesting. But the same is true for progressives, but in reverse. Right? They often celebrate, and I think rightly, the sort of variety of family forms and choices that are open to people, but might be hesitant to credit capitalism, which they claim not to like very much, as being a key part of that, key explanation for that phenomenon, those phenomena with respect to the family. So one of the ways you know you're making, I think, a good argument is you're pissing everybody off. And that's, uh, that's part of, <laughs> part of what, I, what I maybe will do tonight. Or maybe it's the case that we, by doing this, we put some things together that other people haven't put together before. And relatedly, what I want to argue is that this mutual freedom of markets and social life, the freedom people have to form families in the way that they do now, uh, is consistent with and goes with that freedom of markets. And together, they're consistent with this idea of classical liberalism, the idea that government should play a limited role in people's lives, uh, both in the marketplace and in their bedrooms. So that's the overview of the argument. I want to start, though, with two quick points about the family. First, you often hear people say, whatever happened to, or we need to get back to, the traditional family. That phrase, traditional family, is one that people use all the time. And what I want to argue is that this phrase is problematic. In some sense, there's no such thing as a traditional family. One reason for this is that all social institutions evolve and change. Right? 
the family is no exception to this. And what we think of, some people argue, is the traditional family, is this sort of mom, dad, two kids, dad's, uh, Dad works, mom's largely at home, right? The sort of nuclear family idea, all that kind of vision, that sort of 1950s television version of the family, right? The problem with that is that the post-World War II family was a particular historical phenomenon. It's not a universal family structure. If we go back in history, we find a whole bunch of different family forms, even earlier in the 20th century. We find, uh, we find a, a, a whole bunch of different ways that people did. It's also not the case, for example, that women weren't working in the 1950s. One of my favorite points to make when I talk about these issues with my students is if you think about those 50s television shows like Leave it to Beaver and so on that were portraying these stay-at-home moms, right, who, 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 you know, that vision of the traditional family, the actresses who portrayed those traditional moms were working mothers, right? They had kids. They worked. They were actresses. And we know from the history of women's labor force participation, for example, that uh, women have been in the marketplace for all of the 20th century in varying, in varying degrees. So this notion that this sort of 1950s family was somehow a universal right, is problematic. And we can see earlier the role played by extended family and other kinds of, of, of organizational, uh, organizational forms. And that leads us to the other point, which is it's important to distinguish the form families take from the functions that families perform. What families look like is a distinct issue from what families do. We can make that distinction analytically. I think the interesting social scientific question is, how are, what, what, if, it, what if any causal relationship exists? That is, do particular family forms lead to better functioning families? That's the, to me, that's the most fundamental question when we think about families. Do different family forms lead to differentiating, differ, differently functioning families? All I want to say right now is that we need to distinguish those two things. And this is particularly problematic when people talk about this phrase, the normal, a normal family. Is my family normal? What is a normal family? Because normal can have two meanings in this context. It can be a purely descriptive meaning, right? A meaning that says, what do families look like? Okay, that is how many people, how many kids, what's their average income, what's their, you know, what's the range of ethnicities, whatever, right? We can have this sort of descriptive notion of, of normality, right? What's typical, what's average, but we can also have a prescriptive notion of normality. And that's more like, is this family functional, right? When we even use the word dysfunctional to talk about families that don't work very well. And we might use normal in that sense too. Is my family normal might mean, does my family work well? And if we're going to think about these issues, we need to distinguish these two points. And again, this, this talk is a kind of slice of my book that Chris mentioned in the introduction. Um, and, and I want to point out that one of the things uh, that I talk about a lot in the book is this idea that social institutions like families serve particular functions. They're problem solvers, right? And so we need to think very carefully about what the problems families solve are and how well different kinds of family forms solve them. And to recognize that those problems that families have to solve change and evolve over time. And it shouldn't surprise us as those functions that families have to perform change, we would see different forms, different structures evolve to meet, to help better solve those problems. And that's really the historical story I want to tell going to say this afternoon, but it's almost this evening now. That's the story I'd like to tell. So let me start by talking about the modern family. Now, you may be familiar with the TV show uh, that uses this phrase, or you might be familiar with this show too, right? There's another family, okay? And normally when we talk about the modern family, we talk about sort of four general characteristics that define modern families. First, marriage is by choice and by love. And it's important that it's both of those things because we often forget that those are two different things, right? We, we sometimes think of marriage as either being about love or about being arranged by parents or the community or something like that. But there is a third possibility. Marriage can be about choice, but not about love, right? You can choose to marry someone without your parents' involvement for reasons other than love. And I want to note, right, that the modern family is both choice and love. And we'll see how that matters in just a little bit. The modern family is nuclear, private, and insulated. And what I mean by that is when we think about the family, we're thinking about a unit that's separated off from both the market and the state. It's a third space, right? It's part of civil society. 
So in that sense, it's private, right? And it's different from those things. It's insulated, and that it has particular boundaries, right? That we can identify as being the family. And it's nuclear. And the idea behind the nuclear family was, what's the smallest unit possible that, can, can, that could be conceived of as a family? And now we think of that as meaning the parents, and if there's children, children, right? So the nuclear family is th the parents and their kids, as opposed to, again, if we talk about extended family, aunts, uncles, grandparents, right? And we can even go farther than that in some kinds of family forms that we see. But the modern family is nuclear, private, and insulated. It's that group right there. Children are sentimentalized, and childhood is sheltered. This word sheltered is a word that's used in the literature. I'll come back to it in a second. But children are sentimentalized, right? We, 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 the, the thing we call childhood, and particularly the thing we call adolescence, is a peculiarly modern phenomenon. For most of human history, children were sent out into the world at young ages, often apprenticed out or, or went as, as, as assistants or boarders to other people's households, boys sometimes as young as 9, 10, 11. Okay, but now, and we, we thought of children at the time as being sort of these agents of economic activity. They were part of the production unit of the family, a point I'll come back to in a minute. But now we treat ch children much less instrumentally and much more sentimentally. We think about, if you, if you watch The Simpsons, you know the Reverend Lovejoy's wife, right, who pops up all the time saying, but what about the children? Right? That whole view, right, that, that children are special. And we're seeing a whole debate about that now in the context of these free speech debates on campuses. But the children, that childhood is a special time, that children, we, we think of children very sentimentally. And the idea of, shel of the sheltered childhood is we keep our children both out of the market and more generally out of the public arena. We go to school often for 22 years, right? Sometimes more, right? We go to school, we, keep, we, we have places where kids can play. We keep them separate from the world of adults, sheltered from that world in a way that for most, again, of human history, they really weren't for, for, for most people. So children being treated differently. I need to put an L in children there, don't I? Okay. Children are sentimentalized and childhood is sheltered. And finally, equality of the sexes. The modern family is one in which women are generally treated as equals. They're equal under the law, for sure. But they also have more financial resources, more financial independence. Right? The, law doesn't dis the law doesn't treat women differently in the context of marriage. We'll talk about how things used to be in a little bit. Okay? Uh, and in particular, women have now, now have the ability, both legally and financially, to exit marriage. And the increase in divorce is a phenomenon that we see associated with the modern family, in the sense that marriage is about love. Women have the resources to get out of marriages where they're either being treated poorly or where they're just, in some sense, not happy, men too, of course. Uh, and that, that the increase in divorce and this equality of the sexes is a feature of the modern family. Okay. Well, if that's the modern family, what came before it? The pre-modern family. The key to the pre-modern family, as Chris mentioned in the introduction, is that the family was, for most of human history, an economic institution. And in particular, the household was the unit of production. In the language of economics, we can think of the household as being a kind of firm, right? a production unit. What households did was make stuff that would be for their own use, but also would be sold on the market. The easiest way to think about this is an agricultural family, right, who had family farm, but even small crafts and things like that, right, were the family business in some sense, and that uh, what families, did, what the family was, was the unit who produced whatever, whatever this might be. Uh, family members contributed to production. Both women and children were part of that project of producing stuff. As I said, mostly agricultural, but also small crafts. And by the way, there's a way that we know that families were once economic units of production. That's still with us today, though it doesn't carry the same meaning that it did before. And I'm willing to bet there's an example of it in this room right now. Anyone know what I'm talking about? How do we know today that families were once about economic production? About last names. Baker, Brewer. Anyone know what a Cooper did? Chicken soup? Nope. Coopers made barrels. Fletchers? Anyone know what Fle where Fletcher came from? Yeah. Arrows. Excellent. Yeah, they made the little tails on arrows. Right? And all the Smiths, of course. Right? So we have all of these last names that reflect the fact that families were once 
John Smith was John the Smith, right? So, so we know from that that, that, that families uh, were economic institutions. We know from other sources, too. The other thing to remember, of course, is that for most of human history, people, most people anyway, lived at the margins. And what by, I mean by that is they were poor. And that the economic decisions, the economic role that families played was crucial to the survival of communities. And one of the reasons, and we'll talk about this some more in just a minute, one of the reasons that marriage was often arranged in, and still is arranged in poorer societies is precisely because the stakes were so high. Parents felt that their children could, that the community could not afford for their children to make a mistake in terms of who they married. Marrying the wrong person could have economic consequences for the entire community. Of course, the family historically was not just an economic institution. It had other roles, too. And particularly uh, among the upper class, families were a political institution. And we know from all kinds of uh, plays, uh, going back to the Greeks, but certainly through Shakespeare, the role, the sort of political role of the family. Okay, uh, For the rich, it was about political power, right? That marrying the right person, marry, you know, this king's daughter marrying that king's daughter was a way to bring the countries together, was a way to create a political, daughter marrying son, sorry, we jumped a little bit ahead there, um, was, was, a, was a way to, to bring sort of combinations of political power, right, and to create political dynasties. For the poor, right, the political function of marriage was to create additional networks of cooperation and community, and often defense. Right? That one of the great things that marriage does, one of the most important things that marriage does, is it brings you in-laws. It brings you a whole other group of people who are now connected to you, often through grandchildren, right? through the children that you have. And that creates a powerful incentive for people who otherwise would have been strangers to care and invest in you and your family. So if we think about marriage historically, and to some degree even today, certainly among the poor, as being a way to generate cooperation, community, and larger social networks and the resources to, that those social networks can provide, that this is a, additionally a kind of political function that marriage plays for the rich and, again, and for the poor. It, we know this is more commonly talked about in terms of the rich. Again, we have the examples from literature and so on where we, where we see this. So that's the pre-modern family. If we can contrast the pre-modern family to the modern family, here's, what, here's a few things that we see. All right. Again, I'm in the pre-modern family, marriage was often arranged. But even where it was chosen, it was not primarily about love. It was about economic fitness. Right? You married someone because you made a good team for whatever it was that you were producing, including, by the way, children. All right. So we think of, you know, when we think of who do we marry today, right? We think of well, who, you know, who's someone that we love. Why do we love them? It's often because we share certain preferences over the kinds of things we like to do, what we like to consume, for example, right? You know, it's great. We love, we both love to ski, so we go skiing all the time. Or we both love to read. Or we both love great food, right? Or we share the same movies and TV, whatever it is, right? It's often about our shared consumption. Historically, it was about the shared ability to produce. And so one of the things that we've seen is that how, what, even where marriage is chosen, what we're choosing over right, has changed. And with the modern family, it's about love in a way it was not for the pre-modern family. In the pre-modern family, women were more or less property. And in particular, we can talk about what were known as coverture laws. The coverture laws limited the economic role, in some cases eliminated, the economic role of married women. Married women, until really the mid to late 19th century, married women in the West could not own property separately from their husbands. They could not engage, they could not sort of engage in economic contracts separately from their husband. They were covered, hence the word coverture, by their husbands. And if you go back into the British common law, what, what the legal theorists said about this was, was that when you got married, the man and women were man and woman were united in one, and that one was essentially the man. Right, that his identity covered hers. They were one person. And so the notion that she could make a separate contract didn't make sense. You might also think about what that means for the ability of the two of them to enter into any kind of consensual agreement. In particular, I'll, something I'll, I'll, I think I'll come back to later, you might think about the idea of marital rape in that context. If the man and woman are united in one and it's the man, right? is it even possible does the notion of raping one's wife make any sense? And for a long time, it did not, unfortunately. So we'll come back to that in a, in a little bit. Okay, uh, Children, 
were largely seen, not totally, but largely seen, or more seen certainly than today, as economic assets. The notion of kids as being economic assets is a weird thing, too, when we compare to today. Historically, kids were there to be able to produce in the economic ways that we're talking about. Today, of course, you guys are not assets. You're major liabilities. You sit around for 22 years producing absolutely nothing, right, while we spend all kinds of money on you. Now, again, I'm being a little facetious, not you know, not totally, uh, but a little facetious. But it's true, right? Think about how wealthy we are that we can afford to educate our children, right? We don't need them to be produ economically productive. And you see all these studies about how much kids cost, how much it costs to raise kids. And that, again, is a peculiarly modern notion. For most of human history, the, the sort of balance between the pr productivity of children and the expense was much, much more even. Uh, one of the ways children were valuable, of course, as labor on the, on the, on the farm or at, you know, in the craft, they were also valuable as old age support. When, there was no, obviously, Social Security, but even other forms of institutional old age support were non-existent. If you got old and infirm, you relied on your kids to help you out. And that was an important role that kids played. You know, I, I like to have fun with my classes and ask them what they think in, in the late in the 19th century, late 19th century. What was the average retirement age for working men? You know, and they'll guess, you know, 70, 65. And the answer actually is death. Right? There was no such thing as retirement. That for most men, they work literally until they they die. I mean, if, unless you became again sort of infirm and were and were unable to do so. The other thing to keep in mind, of course, with respect to children is that women went through multiple numbers of pregnancies for a variety of reasons. One of them was, again, children were economic assets. If you needed labor on the farm, you could make it yourself. It's kind of fun, too. Okay. Uh, the problem, of course, is that child mortality rates were high, as were maternal mortality rates. Pregnancy was one of the most risky things that women could do. Many women died. Uh, in pregnancy, and it was not uncommon, again, for much of human history, for as many as half of children who were born to not make it to age 18, and many died particularly in their young, uh, young years before one or before five. It was also not uncommon for families to have multiple children with the same first name. You might have two Johns in a family. Why is that? Well, oftentimes parents would name their, give multiple children the same name to ensure that at least one of them survived to adulthood, because odds were that, that only, say, one or two might. So this is a very different world, too. Many women, for most of human history, were sort of constantly either pregnant or nursing throughout their sort of adult, uh, you know, adult childbearing years. And this, again, took a huge toll on women's bodies and women's health. In general, it seems, there was less sentimentality about children. Understandable, perhaps, where children are more likely to die young, where children are seen as economic assets. But certainly, childhood was not viewed with this kind of gauzy, now we might say Victorian, sentimentality about the sort of purity and innocence of children and all the ways we think about it now. Um, it was a much more kind of hard-headed approach to thinking about kids. And then finally, families were much more public institutions. The church, the state, and the community were involved in the kinds of decisions that families made. Again, as I said, right, particularly at times folks living on the margin being uh, who you married mattered a great deal. And so the church, the state, and, and other people in the community had a role in making sure you were sort of enforcing, that in social norms were enforced and you were doing the right kinds of things. What hasn't changed, though, is that the family re was and remains indispensable as a transmitter of cultural norms and values. And so one of the things I want to caution against in this talk is to not read me as saying we don't need families. We do. I do and I believe that the family is indispensable. You can't have a society without families. The question is, what exactly are families doing and what kinds of forms, again, might do it better or worse, and why, and why have we seen the change in these forms? OK, so that's the story of the family. The question is, where does the capitalism part come in? And what I want to argue is it was the changes that capitalism brought that were significantly, though not exclusively, responsible for the transition from the pre-modern to the modern family. So what did capitalism do? First, it made, made wage labor more widespread. The idea that people worked for someone else for a wage rather than working within their own families. Again, it had been, it existed 
but was very much on the margins of the economy until capitalism. And in particular, the factory system was key here because what happens in a factory is you hire people who are not your family, right? You hire people, you people who are, the people who are working in a factory or in a large enterprise in general, right, are not family members. And suddenly, the, the unit of production is no longer solely the family. And what this does is it separates, it separates home from work. Right? You know, we, now we, we think about this idea of going to work and coming home, although with telecommuting, right, we'll come back to that maybe a little later too, right? but certainly for, for again, for the 19th, 18th, 19th, 20th century, it becomes a time when people go to work and come home as a result of this change, rather than doing their work, right, their economic production within the context of the household. And this, as we'll see in a bit, has some important consequences. The other thing that happens with capitalism, and there we see, it's, it's hard to see in this slide, but it's kind of old factory picture there. The other thing that happens is wages and wealth rise. Over time, capitalism generates more and better capital. That enables workers to have more and better capital to work with. Their wages get higher. People begin to get richer throughout the 19th and into the 20th century. That increase in wealth has some consequences for the family. For one, family size shrinks. Right? What happens is that when we first see the transition away from the farm into the factories, wages are low. And oftentimes, mom, dad, and mom, and the kids were working. But as parental wages ro rose, and particularly as, as the wages that men got rose, first, children no longer needed to work, right? And children came back home from the, the factories. And then eventually, women did too. And by the end or so of the 19th century, right, many families were able to support themselves on male wages alone, thanks to the greater, thanks to the greater uh, higher wages that they were beginning to see. Um, I should note here too, right, the, the issue of child labor. Okay, oftentimes people, you know, this is an issue people raise about how terrible capitalism was because of child labor. One of the things to understand is that child labor existed throughout all of human history. We just didn't see it the same way until capitalism. Kids worked on farms. They still do, by the way. And most of the child labor laws even today exempt agriculture. Why? Because kids have always worked, right? For most of human history, they worked on farms. What happened with capitalism is we, they moved, at least for a short period, into the factories where they were more visible and the work was different. But it was also capitalism that ended child labor by driving the increase in wealth that made it possible for families to not have their children have to work anymore in order to be able to survive. And that whole sentimentality of childhood that we're talking about comes about because parents are rich enough to afford to be able to not have their kids work. Parents don't want their kids to work if they are able to do so. Just the problem historically was that oftentimes the child's income was the difference between survival and not surviving. So women and children moved to the home. As the economic functions of the family shift away from the family and out into the marketplace, marriage increasingly becomes about love. For most of human history, marrying for love was an indulgence. It was silliness, right? It was, it was ridiculous. Why? Marriage was too important to be about something silly like love. You had to make sure you could survive. Once economic activity and, and incomes go outside the household, then people could afford to marry for love. Um, how many of you have seen my big fat Greek wedding? All right, a couple. If you have, you, that's one of my favorite movies about this, right? If you know the movie, and if you don't, I can probably get the scene across to you, right? The, the, my favorite scene in the movie, first of all, right, her, her parents are upset because she's not marrying a Greek man. She's marrying Ian Miller, right, who she really loves. That's a problem, right? Um, because you don't marry for love, you marry the right man, okay? It's not so much about economics here, but I'm marrying a Greek man. Remember the scene where she's with her mom, Lainey Kazan, and they're sitting in the kitchen, and she's trying to explain to her mom, look, I, I really love the guy, and she's playing this, and finally, Lainey Kazan, the mom character, just gets so frustrated with hearing this, and she says, she's, she's, oh, Tula, eat something, right? Like, like, you know, this is the silliest thing I've ever heard, right? Marrying for love. And we see this in other movies, too, if you know Fiddler on the Roof, right? Um, when Golda talks about Tavia, do you, do you love me, right? She says, well, you know, 
I grew to love you, right? The whole the theme of that song is, is you live with someone long enough, you learn to love them. And that's a very sort of pre-modern notion of marriage. Today we think about, again, marriage being for love. And we think about all the great works in literature, which are about this conflict, where parents are upset because children are marrying for love and not for sensible economic political reasons. Well, this is what we see happen here. And again, it's not just capitalism. It's also the rhetoric about individuality and individualism we associate with the rise of democracy and the decentralization of church power and all these kinds of things. But certainly capitalism provides the means and the resources to exercise that choice and to exercise those ideas. Um, so wages and wealth rise, marriage becomes about love, and again, as we've said, childhood changes, right? We begin to see this sort of kids getting educated, the sentimentality of childhood, the extension of childhood into adolescence. And now we see people today talking about you know, kids in their 20s as being post-adolescent. They're really not adults yet because they haven't done adult things. And so we've, we've just taken childhood and extended it out. All of these things, along with democracy, of course, privatize the family. The state, the church, and the community are all restrained in their ability to intervene in the choices of adults about who they marry, about how they marry often, and about what they do after they're married. And we can sort of see the distinction here between the sort of public world of the factory and the private world of the household as sort of a site of consumption. And, and one of the things, if you look at these old pictures, right, you'll oftentimes see these pic pictures of the household where in an earlier time you'll see things like spinning wheels and other sort of economic artifacts there. And as you see the more recent pictures, you know, art artwork about houses by the 19th, 20th century, it's clear that houses are about consumption. Think about what's in your kitchen today. And that's all about consumption and, and the rest of your house as well. One of the most fundamental things that happened alongside of this, and particularly into the 20th century, is the changing economic role of women. And I'll take my Marco Rubio sip of water here for a second. All right. Um, the 20th century, one of the most important facts of the 20th century is the growth in female labor force participation. Women moving into the labor force, in paid positions in the labor force, distinct in many ways from their husband, is the key thing that happens over the course of the 20th century and has major repercussions for the organization of the family. Right? Why do we see women into labor force? Well, there's this whole long story here. I teach a whole course on the economics of gender where we talk about these things. But the short version of this really is, uh, is, is sort of two or three things. First. The economy grows, right? Wealth continues to grow. The demand for labor increases. We're producing more stuff. We need more workers. There's only so many men, and employers now have to think about how, what they can do in terms of hiring women. At the same time, right, women are getting more educated. Economically, young women aren't needed to produce. They can go to school. Our rhetoric and our talk about women begins to change. We begin to recognize equality with the end of coverture. The, the constitutional amendment uh, ensuring that all US women had the right to vote. So the la increased labor demand plus greater human capital, greater education and skills means that women can command higher wages in the marketplace. And with higher wages in the marketplace, they're more likely to want to work and able to work than they would be otherwise. At the same time, a decline in the time that women, that somebody, historically women, needed to be at home. Right? What we talk, in economics, we talk about household production. And the time required for household production begins to fall, particularly in the 20th century. Two reasons for that. One, fewer kids. Right? As family size shrinks, the amount of time it takes to care for kids is less. People have fewer kids. There's fewer years in which parents require, are parents required to be at home. And consider, too, kids are going off to school. That leaves time in the day that mom has if she wants to work. So a uh, fall in time needed home because of more children, but also because of technology. Modern uh, kitchen and appliances like washing machines and so forth uh, dramatically reduced the amount of time it took to care for a family. So did modern ovens. Um, there's a great Simpsons episode where Homer's cooking something in a microwave, and he looks at it and goes, isn't there anything faster than a microwave? Right. So I mean, all of these things have fundamentally changed household production. There's a wonderful TV series that was on PBS, and it was originally a BBC series, called 1900 House, that uh, followed a f British family who agreed in 1999 to live for 90 days as if it were 1900. They lived in a house that was restored to 1900 technology for the most part. They, the, the, the woman did not work. They had to wash all their clothes 1900 style. 
use 1900 medical. I mean, all the whole thing. It's a great show. It's about four hours of four hour long episodes. Well worth watching. But what's interesting about that was it took them two or three days to do the laundry. And compared to what we can do today with a washing machine, that's a huge savings in time for women and for children. Sometimes girls would have to miss a day of school per week to help out with the wash. And you can think about what the consequences of that would be. Another great video to watch on this is there's a wonderful TED talk called The Magic Washing Machine by a guy named Hans Rosling, who does great TED Talks, by the way. The Magic Washing Machine, well, I won't spoil it for you, but it's the story about how washing machines liberated women uh, in a whole bunch of different ways. So it's, it's about nine minutes. It's a great TED Talk. It's well, well worth watching. Finally, as people got wealthier, they were able to purchase household production alternatives on the market. People my age, I'm 51, right? So people my age, if you ask them, and for the students, if you ask your parents the following question, ask them when they were your age, when they were kids, how many times per week or per month they ate dinner out. And my guess is what your parents said. You're shaking your head. What would you guess your parents would probably say? Probably never. Yeah, maybe never. On occasion. Yeah, on occasion. I think that's about right. Yeah, maybe maybe a couple times a month, maybe, mm -hmm. right? Once a week would be, be perhaps surprising. right? Certainly when I was a kid, that was about right, a couple times a month. How many times do you guys eat out? right, per week or per month, right? right? Big difference, right? Do you know, ask your parents if they ever paid someone to get their nails done or do their taxes. How much did they take their laundry to the dry cleaner? The nails are my favorite. My dad's 77. He gets pedicures from time to time. Like, really? Yeah, who did that when we were young? Nobody did that, right? Nobody did that, right? So we're able to Outsource, if you want to think about it this way. Oh, and the biggest one of all, of course, right? Child care, right? We outsource child care. All of our wealth enables us to purchase those alternatives to doing it ourselves on the marketplace. That has incredibly changed the ability of women to be able to, to, to join the labor force. It's important to note that this increase predates the 1960s. There's this story out there that goes something like the following. Here's the history of the 20th century. Women didn't work, women didn't work, women didn't work, women didn't work. 1960s, women work, right? It's the sort of hockey stick story, right? That's New Orleans and hockey doesn't really go together. So anyway, uh, it's a hockey stick story. It's not true, right? Women worked throughout the 20th century, and that increase in women's labor force participation was a gradual increase. What we saw happen after the 60s and 70s, uh, true enough, is an increase in the number of women with very young children who were working, children particularly under the age of one. But if, we look, if you look at the data, you don't see this huge jump after the 1960s. It's a fairly gradual increase. It increases a little bit faster after the 60s, but not a huge one. And one argument here is that feminism, the feminist movement, might well be a result of these changes over the whole century rather than a cause. In other words, the reason we saw a feminist movement by the 1960s and 70s is that women were already coming into the workforce. We're already dealing with these problems, right? Think Mad Men, okay? Think the world of Mad Men and think about the, the problems the women in that series faced in the workplace, why that might lead them to become feminists and lead them to want equal rights in ways rather than the equal rights leading them into the workforce. So that's an interesting hypothesis to think about. And if you want to really identify a more important cause of all this in the 1960s, right, it's the pill. Right? The fact that we had a female contraceptive that gave women complete control over their own fertility and was effective and reasonably safe fundamentally transformed many of these things that we're talking about. It enabled women to delay marriage. It enabled women to begin careers. Uh, it, and it, it changed the power dynamic between the, the, between the sexes. It ended a lot of shotgun marriages, right? All these kinds of things had profound, uh, a profound impact on the subsequent course of the history of the 20th century. So in many ways, the pill is, is the key piece of the picture here, OK? So a couple of things we might say about family in the 20th century, then, and I'll say a few words about family in the 21st before some, before some final thoughts, OK? Um, what I want to talk about here a little bit is the decline in marriage rates and the increase in divorce rates, which is certainly a key demographic feature we've seen recently. And so one way to think about this is that capitalism's wealth led to two key trends. One, as we mentioned, women's financial independence. And the result of this was a decline in the benefits of specialization by gender. If you think about it for a minute, right, 
for that period of time when men were largely the income earners and women were largely the specialists in household production, there was a real good deal to be struck here, right? We had specialization. Economists like specialization. And economists say if people specialize, they can benefit by trading with each other and taking advantage of the productivity of specialization. So women benefited by, from men's income. Men benefited from having someone at home to help raise the kids. Sounds like a good deal. But as women's human capital has begun to look more and more like men's, as, it's conver as those human capital has converged, as women have more job skills, are more educated, there's more women students in this classroom than male, okay? As those things have happened, the benefits of specialization by gender and the, and the benefits of combining that, right, of bringing the two genders together and, 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 and reaping the benefits has declined. And in a way, marriage doesn't quite provide the same economic benefits because of that decline in specialization than it, than it did before. So in material terms, marriage might offer fewer benefits than it did before. Now, that's a different question from sort of psychological and emotional terms in which marriage might be much, might have a much bigger role than it did before. And so one way to think about the family is what's happened over time is that as the economic functions of marriage and the family have exited into the marketplace, it left this gap that's been filled by this larger emotional psychological role. Right? In fact, now it's mostly about love. Right? Why do we marry people? Because we love them. Why do we divorce them? Because we don't love each other anymore. Right? It's all about love. Okay? That's a relatively recent phenomenon, like the last 150 years or so, and a revolutionary one, one that fundamentally changed marriage. Okay? It shouldn't surprise us, then, that we see an increase in the divorce rate. Okay? One way to think about this, the way economists might talk about this, is that both preferences and constraints have changed. Let me talk about constraints first, because that's the easier one. The changing constraint is this, women's financial independence. Women can exit in ways they couldn't before. Whether the marriage is abusive, which is certainly a problem historically, now women can get out, or whether women are in some sense just fundamentally unhappy or whatever it might be, they have the ability to leave the marriage in a way they didn't before. On the preference side, notice something else. As the emotional psychological functions of marriage and family have become more important, the bar for a happy marriage is much higher. Right? Now it's not just about can we get along and grow the cotton right? or farm the corn, you know, raise the corn. It's are we happy? And it's not surprising that as our expectations of what marriage should deliver have gone up. If you know some psychology, you can think about this as sort of being higher on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. right? As, the, as, as marriage is expected to fill these higher order needs, should it surprise us that more marriages don't quite get there? That more people feel like this isn't what it, we thought it would be? And ironically, right, ironically, the notion of making marriage about love might help explain higher divorce rates. Right? And there's a real interesting, weird, weird thing there, right? And oftentimes, by the way, it's the people who are arguing that marriage should be about love who are most concerned about the rising divorce rate. But wait, the fact that it's about love might be one of the reasons why more people are getting divorced, is that if we keep saying it's about love, it's about love, it's about love, and it's not, and it isn't, doesn't have love in it anymore, people are leaving. Now, you might say, right, you know, kind of response is, well, yeah, it's about love, but it's also about responsibility to the kids and so on. And that's certainly true, right? And certainly there's people who hesitate from leaving marriages because of, of, the, of, the, of the impact on kids. But adults matter too, right? And, and unhappy people and stressed out couples don't make very good parents. And there's a whole interesting debate in the divorce literature about this. Last point I want to make here, though, is that all this change is change that wealth and freedom made this, in some sense, inevitable. The dynamic growth we, we attach to the marketplace, that comes with the marketplace, has created the conditions for this sort of change in, the, in, in, in family structure. And to think that we can reverse it, to think that somehow we can push the divorce rate back down to where it was 100 years ago, right? Or, or, you know, reverse those trends, I think is wishful thinking. I think this is, you can't put this toothpaste back in the tube. We can perhaps do things on the margin, and there's a number of sort of economic and social policies that make it less likely that people marry, 
For example, the fact that we keep locking up lots of African American men for drug for violations of the drug laws means that black women don't have people to marry. Right? There's a problem. Okay, in, in a different world where we didn't have these draconian drug laws, we might help address the marriage problem among poor African American communities. But there's other laws too that we might talk about that affect that affect this. But in general, right? The idea that people are marrying later, more likely to get divorced than 50 or 100 years ago. I don't think that's going to turn around. So let's say a few words about the 21st century. Obviously, one big issue has dominated talk of marriage in the 21st century, and that's the demand for same-sex marriage. Now, you can when I first started giving this talk a few years ago, right? You know, we weren't in the world we're in now, <laughs> where, where in fact in the United States it is it is illegal to ban same-sex marriage. Um, but what I want to argue is that, that getting to where we are today has been a product of the same set of forces that we've been talking about all along. That capitalism and its wealth produced several things that led to both the rise of homosexuality as a kind of identity that people would take on, okay? And then, not surprisingly, gays and lesbians asking to be included in the institution of marriage. So for one thing, right, in a post-capital, in a capitalist world, the advent of capitalism, it was possible to survive outside the family, economically survive outside the family. You didn't need a family to produce and survive economically. You could live as a single person and survive. You didn't need kids or a spouse to, to survive. The growth of cities made anonymity, pos an anonymity possible. Throughout human history, right, people have always engaged in homosexual behavior. Right? There's always been same-sex acts. What's unique really to the 20th and 21st century is the idea of living one's life as a gay or lesbian person. Okay? Um, and cities may, pop, you know, were part of making that possible. I just noticed another typo. That should be a broader ethos, ethos of anything that's peaceful. Right? The sort of liberal idea of letting people live the lives they wish as long as they're not harming others. Certainly we've seen that in the 20th century and the civil rights movement in general right, uh, has, has, is part of this. The separation of sex, marriage, and kids, right? It used to be the case that you did all of those together with the same person, right? You got married, you had sex, you produced kids. But now, right, thanks to contraception, thanks to changing social mores, you can have sex without being married, you can have sex without having kids, you can have kids without being married, right? And you can sort of do all these things separately in ways that you couldn't before. And finally, as we've talked about, the change in marriage from being about economics to being about love. All of these things together, unsurprisingly, have given us the demand for same-sex marriage. Same-sex couples are saying, well, look, if marriage is about love, and sex, marriage, and kids aren't the same anymore, and all these other things are true, why are we being excluded? Why, isn't, why can't marriage be for us as well? As I suggested, the real revolutionary change in the family was when capitalism helped make marriage about love. When marriage became about love, that was the key change. And once that happened, it's not at all surprising. I don't want to say it's inevitable, but it's not at all surprising anyway that we be where we are today with the demand for same-sex marriage and now, in fact, in the United States, the, the, the change, the, the Supreme Court decision that has made it the law of the land. So again, we come back to my question. Western civilization needs families as norms and transmitters and transmitters of culture. The question is whether multiple forms of the family are able to do so. I don't have the time tonight to go into that. I'm happy to talk some about it in the question and answer period. I talk a little bit more about it in my book that Chris mentioned. Um, but I just want to suggest that what we've seen happen over the course of human history right, is that as the functions of family have changed, the forms that that fulfill those functions have changed as well. And families, what families need to be doing is different today than it was 50 or 100 or 200 or 500 years ago. And it's not surprising that the forms have changed as well. The other question I'd like to you know, think about is the following. When we ask, is a, you know, is a particular family form functional? Does it work? Oftentimes, I think we think in terms of, to put it in an academic context, con context we think to ourselves, are all families able to get an A in raising children, right? Or doing the things that families need to do. And what I want to suggest is getting an A might not be the way to, best way to think about it, right? It might be the case that pass fail is a better way to think about it. It's just not possible for every family to get an A in raising children. Families face real resources, real resource constraints. 
Genetics matter. Kids do things parents can't control. The question is whether different forms are sufficiently functional. And I want to rem make the reminder that parents count too. That if all we care about when we think about families are what about the children? We're missing out on an important piece, that the psychological well-being of parents also matters. And we know from the literature that stressed out parents, that, 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 that marriages with a lot of strife in them are really bad for kids. And so when we think about all of these questions, single parenthood, same-sex parenthood, right? Thinking in terms of two loving parents, yeah, that's the ideal. But if we can't get that ideal, or Put it better way, if, if that ideal is not working out, it may be doing more harm for kids than alternative family structures are. So again, worth thinking about. Final thoughts. There's my buddy Hayek. All right, and I want to quote from my buddy Hayek. I love Hayek with the sunglasses. All right? The liberal position is based on courage and confidence and a preparedness to let change run its course, even if we cannot predict where it will lead. And I think that's a good thought here. Free markets, capitalism, produce a social world that we cannot and should not try to control. Liberalism, classical liberalism, has a rational optimism that its, result, its results will be desirable. And capitalism and classical liberalism turn the family from a repressive and patriarchal institution into a loving and far more equal one. I think that's not a small accomplishment and one that we should not take for granted. Um, and I'll add, coming this fall, it's out. Uh, is my book. It's very expensive, but maybe one day it'll be in paperback. Maybe one day a PDF will magically appear online somewhere. Uh, and when it does, uh, I hope you get a chance to read it. So thanks for listening. And I guess we've got till, till about at least 7 o'clock, Chris? Till, yeah, yeah. 7 to 7. Uh, remember when you want to ask a question, hit the button on your King, I might as well go go first. Can can you say a little bit more about what you think the connection is between capitalism and marriage being about love? Because if you go back, can you go back to yeah. two slides? So the claim there at the bottom is that uh, yeah, that capitalism made marriage about love. And do you really mean that, or do you mean that just capitalism made it possible yes. for marriage to be about love because? Yes. Okay, so yeah. so it's yeah, it's not as if people didn't love each other, right, when they were married. Yeah, I, I think the way you phrase it's probably somewhat more artful. Is that capitalism made it possible for marriage to be about love? And I and I would argue, by the way, the same thing is true of when we think about children. Capitalism made it possible for people to love and be sentimental about their children in the way that we are today. It's not that people in an earlier time didn't love their children or want to care deeply about their children. Sometimes they didn't have the resources, but more importantly, you know, they knew life was fragile and, and, and it was, you know, the costs of expressing that love in the way that we do today were much higher because, you know, I have a great, I don't, I should put it in this presentation. I have a slide. It was taken by a friend of mine who took it here in New Orleans at one of the crypts, you know, at the cemetery. And it's, it's a whole sort of uh, a piece of stone with a list of like six or eight kids' names on it from the same family, all of whom died before reaching adulthood. You know, and in that world, wow, how, you know, it's hard to invest yourself in your kids. You might wish to, but it's hard to in a way that it is today. So I think that's right. It made it possible for us. It made it, 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 it unleashed those emotional reactions and those emotional possibilities that were probably there all along in some sense, but that, that, that were costly to surface. I do think in the case of marriage, people who, were, who oftentimes got married did, you know, learned to love each other. You know, we talk about falling in love, then getting married. And I suspect for many people historically, you got married and you fell in love with the person. And part of it was you had this immense collaborative task, very difficult collaborative task that you were engaged in. And it's, you know, it's hard not to come to that kind of feeling toward a person when you're doing that work. Right. So, so that was the descriptive question. And maybe this is not a question for an economist, but I'll ask it anyway. I, I do have an undergraduate philosophy degree, so. Okay. So, and I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night, so we're good. No, you didn't. We put did. you at a better hotel than that. <laughs> <laughs>
do you think we're better off with marriage? I mean, you've done some sociological work on marriage. Do you think we're better off as, as say, a society with marriage being about love than well, about econo purely economic issues? What do you mean by better off? Well, yeah, I'm a philosophy major. I get to ask the question. I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you define better off because I could say stability, but maybe that's not what we want. But right. maybe if you want to talk about promoting well-being generally, yeah. or how, I yeah, mean, I, I think I think that we look. I, it's I don't. I try not to talk about happiness because I think that happiness is is so anchored to baselines that making happiness comparisons across generations is very difficult. Okay. Um, but I certainly think that as, as marriage, as love became the key to marriage, it became a lot harder for men to do bad stuff to women. And that's not unimportant. Um, when women were viewed predominantly as an economic asset, it was easier to justify lots of things. I mean, there's stories, right, of you know, 16th, 17th century men <laughs> You know, being more likely to call for medical help when one of their cows or an ox was sick than their wife, because because the the cow or the ox was worth more, right? And the wife was easy to replace, but a good ox, right? I mean, that's what they'd say, right? So, I think, you know, for women, that marriage is about love has been a huge gain, and we see at roughly the same time that marriage begins to transform into being about love, we see a couple of things happen. We see domestic violence begin to be frowned upon. It doesn't really kind of disappear in a significant way. It's certainly not totally disappeared, but certainly much less today than it used to be. I mean, we don't see the end of marital rape laws in some states until the 1970s and 80s. But in literature, you begin to see it portrayed in a negative light in the late 19th century. Um, the notion that, uh, that women's sexual happiness is important becomes more commonly accepted into the 20th century, as women can say, you, you you know, we're married because we love each other. That means you should be treating me as an equal. Now, how much actual political and economic leverage they had to enforce that, right, changes over the century. But the idea that's that that love that that intersection of love and equality and an expectation of fair treatment in marriage, I think that's a huge change that love brought. Um, you know, it, it raised expectations, so we see more divorce, and I think that's, you know, that's a wash, right? I mean, it, people might well be happier in that they're married to a person who they have more in common with and can do all these things with and, and you know, really love in some deep, profound sense. But at the same time, it's also set up a lot of disappointment and heartache and, and so on. So, but it's also enabled women to get out of marriages that were left. So, uh, yeah, I think we're better off, but that doesn't mean there, weren't, there haven't been costs, right? I mean, there's, there's, you know, and you hear people every once in a while say, you know, Arranged marriage wasn't such a terrible thing, right? Because you know, sometimes parents sometimes know better, right? What and and that might not, you know, certainly in an older world that was probably true. One last point, I make this point in the book. You know, uh, Simmel, the call him philosopher, sociologist, when you call him George Simmel, makes the point that, and he wrote this in Philosophy of Money, you know, 100 plus years ago, that people are marrying. One of the things that's happening, he saw happening in front of him, was that marriage was becoming trickier because people were more differentiated than they used to be. And what he was arguing was that sort of commercial society modernity had enabled, you know, people were gaining, language of economics, sort of more specific human capital. And that made people more, you know, there was a range of people out there who you could interact with and meet and marry. Whereas for much of human history, the sort of variation in skills and interests among people was much narrower. And that differentiation, he argued, made it both harder to find someone to marry and perhaps also harder to sustain that marriage. Now I'm rambling, but let me throw one more thing into this. I think we're faced with a really interesting uh, social challenge, I don't know what the word is, in the 21st century with the extension of life expectancies. We don't know if human beings can stay married to the same person for 75 or 80 or 90 years. We just don't know. Right? If we start to live to be 120, which I think would be great, by the way, I'm all in favor of longer lives, but we don't know what that means. I mean, we what, it might be a good thing people are getting married later, right? And, and I, the other part of this is, when do you, in some sense, when do you really need a marital partner? I think it's at the end of your life. I think you need someone at the end when you're maybe retired and you want to travel and do things. When you're sick, more likely to be sick or infirm, you need someone to care for you. In some ways, right, 
again, I'm not saying only at the end of your life, but but this, those kind of functions are really important. And having someone at the end of your life is, I think, is really crucial. Uh, and how marriage is going to play out in, in that world, interesting question. One possibility is we see sort of serial marriages. People marry one person for a certain period of time, maybe raise kids with them, maybe move on to someone else, and maybe it's a third person in their old age. We hear people today talk about starter marriages, right? You get married someone early, maybe divorced before you have kids because you kind of realize this isn't the person I want to have kids with. So I think there's all kinds of possibilities out there. But the notion that somehow we can stick it out, as it were, with the same person, maybe now for 75 or 80 or 90 years. I don't know if we're capable of that, biologically, sort of evolutionary. That's an interesting question. So that's a long answer. Yes, sir? Oh, I'm sorry. You, know, you bring up that point that maybe uh, we can't last together that long. Well, then should the state take their, their uh, um, two cents out of it and not encourage marriage? Yeah, so, OK. Here's my view on this. I, I would like the state to be as neutral as it could be towards marriage. I don't want to see governments penalize it, but I don't want to see them subsidize it either. Whether, the, whether government should be in the marriage and marriage license business at all, I think is a really interesting question. In an ideal world, that's an that's a intriguing possibility. It solves perhaps some of the problems that we see now debating over what the role should be. Right? Uh, we saw it with same-sex marriage. I suspect we're going to see it down the road with plural marriage as well. Uh, but that's a really hard thing to do when so much of what government does is often dependent upon the, the de you know, being married. So what does it mean for government to be neutral with respect to marriage? That's not so clear either. It's, it's, uh, it's a really, really difficult knot to untangle. But in my, you know, ideally, I would like marriage, I would like the state to be as neutral towards marriage as it can be though I don't think it can ever be totally neutral, uh, just because it's, so, it's such a complicated, fraught question. And if we could get to a world where the state wasn't the arbiter of who is and who isn't married, I would be happy with that. But that requires us dismantling other parts of what the state does first <laughs> before then we can pull the plug. Where, when marriage doesn't matter for so many things, because those things aren't things the state's doing, then we can pull the plug on the state and marriage. So I, you know, if people who classical liberals who want to argue the state ought to get out of marriage, I think they're better off spending their energy on getting the state out of other things first and then see where we can go and then see whether we really want it involved in marriage. Is, does that answer your question? Is that the kind of thing you were? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go. Uh, it's the bottom. bottom. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Um, I had a question about, you said it earlier about economic access for ch children are in economic access. A asset, yeah. Asset, yeah, sorry. Um, do you, have you noticed any, because uh, I know you study e economics and like trends and stuff like that, have you seen any trends like for maybe like a neo pre-modern family emerging based yeah. on wealth inequality and s stuff like the child, you know, child uh, tax credits? So what, what are you thinking would be evidence of that? I, I guess like because there's a common notion I think in like uh, at least with conservatives that like people will have kids um, so they can take advantage. Oh, of so so poor access. families taking having more kids to get more welfare benefits, kind yeah. of that kind of thing. What I know of the empirical literature, that effect is very very weak. That there's some positive effect there that that higher benefits will generate more kids, but it's very weak. Um, and that, the, that in most, and certainly since welfare reform, the benefits that parents get in most states really don't outweigh the costs. Um, I think, you know, the, the, there's other reasons where perhaps why we see mo the number of out of wedlock births we're seeing, again, particularly among African American families, as I've suggested. And there's perhaps other bad policies in play that discourage marriage among the poor, right? And that lead to more kids being born outside of wedlock. So I'm more concerned not so much about the welfare system, though that matters too, but the interaction of the welfare system and the tax system, which together often penalize marriage among the poor by if you get married, you lose benefits and, and see increased taxation, and that's like a double whammy. And so there's some interesting work. I think Sean Mulholland, who teaches at Stonehill College has done some stuff on this. And Sean talks about the way, it has a nice graph that's been around, about the way, what the effective marginal tax rate is for poor folks as they sort of move up different income levels. And you can just see, right, that, the, that those impact 
that marriage matters there uh, and that it strongly discourages marriage among the poor. Uh, that's a problem, right? And to go back to the other question, while we perhaps don't want to subsidize marriage, we certainly don't want to discourage it because one of the things we know, marriage is awesome for you, okay? Married people are happier, they live longer, they're healthier, they have more and better sex. Almost every dimension you can imagine, marriage is a good thing, okay? Um, but we want to make sure people are getting married not because they're doing it for artificially distorted incentives or that they're being discouraged from doing it by artificially distorted incentives. If, again, I don't know if it's possible, but I'd like to see the state be as neutral as it can. Um, and I'd like to see us, you know, to the extent that we can do it culturally uh, in, outside of the political realm, recognize the, the value to marriage. Um, for me, that means any two people. It's not, those, that, those benefits of marriage are not just about you know, heterosexual couples, uh, but marriage is awesome, right? You know, marriage is good for us. So I, I don't know if that gets it or not, but yeah. I didn't want to preempt one of the, the students. So just a couple of thoughts. The first would be a sort of global criticism that there's a danger that I think we see in the talk that I was kind of hinting at earlier that I'm yeah. sort of worried about from the title, um, which is that um, it's an economic hammer that sees yep. everything as a nail. nail. Yeah, I'm a Marxist. So, so if the, yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you if you had been a sociologist, right, you would have said that the function of marriage was about domesticating sex, yeah. right? Right. If you were a philosopher, you'd say, well, look, all that economic activity is merely ministerial. It's merely uh, it's a means to the end. The real end. It's instrumental for forming the next generation of adults. We wouldn't grow all that food if we didn't need right. the money that we would get to buy things for the, for the kids. It's really all about the kids. The political scientists would say it's really all about socialization. Yep. And, and I'm tempted to say it's, it's all of those yes. things. But I guess the challenge then is you privilege, is, is there any reason other than Horowitz is an, an economist for privileging yeah. economics in the way that you claim to? That's a great question. Let me tackle th sort of three responses. I agree with you that families today in particular do all of those things. I mean, I, I spend a bunch of time in the book talking about the socialization aspect um, and certainly talking about the, 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 the child raising aspect and, and uh, all of yes, yes to all of those things. And in fact, one of the ways that one of the reasons we can focus more on those things today is we don't have the economic functions that we used to have, right? That have been sort of now are outside of the family, and all that psychological, uh, uh, affective sorts of things are in. And so we can we can really do those things in some ways that we that we couldn't before. And I, and I think I should note those are the things I think the family's indispensable for. I think families, parents, are in a particularly good situation to be the ones who should do those things as opposed to the state or the village or the republic or, or, or whatever, right? Uh, so, so I think that's one, that's one thing. That said, okay, I do think that uh, the, the transformation in economic institutions, if I were a Marxist, I would say the relations of production, right, uh, is, not, is, is, you know, first among equals maybe, right, uh, in the sense that it, that it's, those changes were profound and long-lasting, okay? Uh, I, third, one of the things I like to do in this talk in particular is be prov just to provoke exactly the response that you've given me by, by, by perhaps stating the argument more strongly than I even do in the book, okay, by sort of, by sort of putting right in your face the claim that capitalism is the, is the prime mover here. Um, I, I do think it's, I mean, again, this may be my biases as an economist, even though I think of myself as an interdisciplinary one, that I do think the economic aspects, the economic changes that drove these ch other changes are, are, are significantly important ones. But, but you're right, the other things matter too. And, and I'm a really big fan of Deidre McCloskey, and, and sort of Deidre's response to some of this stuff is to accuse me of forgetting what she calls the habits of the lip, right, which is how we talk about things, right, and the, and the language of equality and the, the language of the, you know, what she calls the bourgeois virtues and all that, that. And I think that's important too, right? I mean, certainly into the 20th century, the way we began to talk about women, the way we began to talk about individual choice matter here independent of, in some sense, the economic forces. That said, put my economist hat back on, that said, right, I do think that fundamental social change is limited 
by the by economic realities. So just as one example, you can't eliminate if you try to eliminate you can't in some sense eliminate child labor legally in a world where parents need the kids to work to survive. Because parents are going to say, I'm sorry, we, you know, you've either condemned us to mass poverty, which has happened in some parts of the world, or they're going to try to get around the law. And so to some degree, these other kinds of changes that we see happen, while themselves are not economic or economic in origin, the ability to bring them into play may be, may be conditional on economic change. So yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I, I don't, I don't we, we might dispute the degree to which the economics matters compared to these other things, but I do think those are in play too. Okay, I just had yeah. one more, and that is that, um, and I'm glad you brought up the bourgeois values because that, yeah. that figures in, and that is that um, economics is all about trade-offs. Yeah. And you may spend a lot more time in the book on some of the things that we've been trading away, but here we got a sort of, uh, I don't know, Whiggish view, yes. right? That it was. Yes. It, it, Rose, it, I had the rose-colored glasses. Right. On. That this was Absolutely. all progress. Yes. So good. It seemed to me that uh, a, a dimension that ought to be part of it, and may in fact be yeah. in the book, is the issue of commitment. Yeah. And so, in making in making marriage mostly about love, what we've traded away is commitment. Yeah. Um, and that, that becomes a problem because there are some interesting facts that may go into the, your thinking about that. One is that divorce rates are falling and have yes. been for a long time. Since it's about 1980. About Slow, yeah. 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 Yeah, slowly and cohort rates are yeah. down a bit. Yes. Yeah. So but we might explain that in two different ways. I'm curious why you think that is. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't pretend to know exactly okay. why that is. But divorce yeah. rates are falling. So that means sort of the, the myth of we make it about love yeah. and then – Right, divorce is the consequence. Yes. Divorce is falling in part. It's because fewer. Pe I think it's because fewer people are getting married. Yes, and fewer but better marriages. And marriage is coming to be seen as a capstone event yep. rather than a foundation yes. event in adult life. A right. Excellent. So yes. I was almost 40 before I got married. In I my was 44. In my parents' age, that that would be unthinkable. Yeah. Um, so that's that's one that's one thing. I think about that's it. exactly right. Now I think so. We I think. Of, that brings us to the same-sex marriage you get to at the end. I really think, and I just want to prod you on this, yeah. I really think same-sex marriage wasn't so much about that marriage was about love because same-sex couples had that and have that without marriage. Most are choosing still not to get married. Most will continue to choose not to get married. In fact, when I, this dates me. I, I was an undergraduate in the 90s in an English department. there taking queer theory classes. The general view was... Marriage is heteronormative, heteronormative. And, we, and we don't want it. Right. In fact, we don't want it. And that, for a quick second, yeah. my dean is a little bit older than I am, and she has a wonderful book that makes exactly this argument that marriage is heteronormative and, yeah. and, and, and queer folks shouldn't want it, right? And, and it was 1999, I guess. And uh, it's great because when I read it, I said to her, I said to her, I read your book, and this was, you know, 15 years ago. I said, I have to tell you, half the time I thought, yeah, this is awesome. The other half, I said, I just want to throw this book against the wall, <laughs> right? And she, and she just smiled and said, I can't ask for more than that, right? And so it's interesting, when this book came out, I said to her, I said, you know, your, your other book, your book's cited a couple times in here. And she kind of raised an eyebrow at me. Like, and I said, oh, no, it's, 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 it's either neutral or positive. Don't worry. It's, yeah. But yeah, no, I think that's, I think yeah, that, that's, that's right. why I think like and, the Supreme yeah. Court decision makes this pretty clear that it's really, it's really about bourgeois respectability. Yeah, and, but, right. And I think, I think that's right. But I, but I think, I think that that came out of the fact that same sex couples, gays and lesbians began to see their relationships being like the other bourgeois relationships that heterosexuals had. So in that sense, right, it's about, it's about all that stuff, right? That, that all of a sudden, my, you know, John's relationship with David looks a lot more like John's relationship with Marsha. John's relationship with Marsha is about love and all those things, and it has that bourgeois respectability. We want in on that. Yeah, I think that's right. I'm, I'm not sure we're at odds here. I think I just think that when I say it's about love, it's about the public recognition that that love is valued in the way that heterosexual love is. It's I think it's an interesting question to see whether or not marriage rates among same sex among gays and lesbians will be comparable to what we see among heterosexuals. As I'm thinking on my feet here, so I'll just make kind of two comments. I think one is there's a generational question whether kids to young gays and lesbians today 
for whom the world has always been like this will not will, will be okay in a way getting married in a, uh, and think of marriage as being normal. I mean, Andrew Sullivan's virtually normal, right? 20 years ago, sort of got you know got at this kind of point. And I think the other question is whether or not so related question is, will that generation how much will that generation of gays and lesbians be affected by parallel things among heterosexuals that perhaps are less, you know, are more skeptical of marriage or delay marriage or those, those kind of things too. So I, 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 you know, it's an interesting question to me whether the current generation of 30s and 40 something gays and lesbians who were raised in a world, a very different kind of world where it wasn't okay and where the queer theory stuff was, you know, part of the pushback, whether there'll be a difference. It's good, I don't have a good, my, my hunch is, and this gets to your talk about the things the state is involved yeah. in that affect marriage, let this, we've got a very sharp rise in the number of same-sex marriages in the last six yeah. months with yeah. Obergefell. Yeah. Um, let that generation of folks go through nasty, protracted, bitter <laughs> community property disputes and divorce court. And my hunch is that 15 to 25 years from now, um, we will see a sharp tumble in um, in same-sex marriages for that reason, that the couples will figure, eh, I've seen nasty divorces. Yeah. It's not anything I want well, anything to do with. Right, right. So let me push back at that a little bit, okay? Because if that's true, you know, that, that, might be, that might be an explanation for the lower marriage rates today among heterosexual couples, is that these are the kids of the, the divorce boom of the 70s and 80s. And they saw that and said, nope, not going to do that. On the other hand, Kids who went through that might say, I saw that. I don't want that to happen to me. If I'm going to get married, I'm going to work harder at it. I'm going to be more committed. I, I know what it does to kids. I won't be perhaps as quick to pull the trigger on a divorce as I was before. So, yeah, I get these, you know, the, 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 for me, the awesome part of these issues is, is that there's so many complicated causal factors intersecting here. Uh, and it's, it, it's hard sometimes to tease things out. And, and part of my part of the fun for me with this talk is again making a kind of in your face argument that that gets just this kind of conversation going. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for your patience tonight.